Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Emirates Society of Colon and Rectal Surgery, SCURS, and in collaboration with NAGI team, we are welcoming you this evening's SCURS first webinar, which will take place, which will take us through a journey highlighting robotic approach in colorectal surgery. SCURS was initiated in November 2020 under the umbrella of Emirates Medical Association, and we are five board members, including myself as a president and Dr. Zakir Mohammed as the vice president, Dr. Roger Georgi, who is the chairperson of scientific committee and uh, moderator for this webinar, Dr. Antonio, who is the general secretary, and Dr. Valentina, who is the chairperson of cultural and media. Our aim is knowledge transfer and exchange experience among professionals locally, within GCC and internationally by conducting webinars and workshops, conferences during the coming years. This webinar has a three CME hours. A link will be sent in the chat box and the attendees should score more than 60% to get their CME certificates instantly. Now I'm passing the mic to Dr. Zakir to go through the poll questions with the attendees. Dr. Zakir? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, welcome to our first uh, Rob webinar on robotic colorectal surgery. It's a proud moment for all of us in UAE to have formed the first colorectal society and to launch such a successful um, webinar. Before we start, we've got a, a, a wide spectrum of speakers, from internationally known speakers, who are going to go through the robotic surgery. What we would like is to get an idea of uh, the uh, the understanding of robotic surgery amongst the audience to start with. So we've uh, featured three questions. The first three of them are to sort of get an understanding and hopefully if they're not in favor of the robotic surgery, the speakers can convince you by the end of this talk. And the third, uh, the fourth and the fifth are more regarding uh, your liking towards getting a robotic surgery training in the future. So uh, please answer these questions. Um, Gina, can, can we, Get the results of this, please. Right, thank you. Right, so what I'll do is I'll pump on to Dr. Roger, who can uh, who will take you through the course material, and we can look at the results at the end. Welcome all to the first um, SCARS webinar, and I'm very happy to uh, be uh, moderating this webinar. I am honored to uh, present the faculty for this webinar. We have three eminent speakers. Um, the first one. The first one is Marcus Gomez. Marcus has dedicated his career to robotic surgery. He's uh, currently the director of robotic surgery programs in, in Santander, Spain. He is an honorary member of the Brazilian College of Surgeons, and uh, he has also dedicated a lot of his time for training uh, for robotic surgery, and is currently the member of Education Committee for the ESCP. Uh, training program called Robotica, and I would suggest that you uh, look at that and uh, join us. Um, Marcus travels all around the world and uh, has uh, wonderful presentations for robotic surgery and uh, also for uh, uh, robotic right hand collectivities that we will hear about today. He has been a uh, working, I've, I've been working together with him since 2006, mainly uh, uh, 2016, mainly as uh, 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 training uh, in robotic surgery. Um, the next speaker is Faik Jamali, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, uh, rectal cancer. Uh, he is a fellow of American College of Surgeons. Uh, he's when I first met him a couple of years ago in the university, uh, American University of Beirut, where he acted as a professor and a surgeon. And he fortunately decided to move to UAE and currently working at uh, Sheikh Shahut Medical uh, City in Abu Dhabi. Welcome so much, Fai. And the last speaker is Shafiq Sidani. He is uh, also Lebanese, uh, educated in Lebanon, but trained in the US. 
uh, board certif uh, certified colorectal surgeon and section head at CCAD for colorectal surgery. Shafiq has, um, uh, has uh, us, uh, the other faculty, very high interest in intermittent basis surgery, uh, both robotic and laparoscopic. And I know he has a little bit of heart for the enhanced recovery program. Aside of his work, which he uh, probably not do so much, he's out fishing a lot. So uh, fishing is what he actually does most. The program is like this. Uh, you heard Sarah and the poll question. I think when I end this, uh, we will go back to the poll questions and then we'll start with uh, Marcus presenting robotic CME and what he thinks about that. And then Fayek will talk about rectal, uh, robotic rectal sections. And we end up with uh, Shafiq, who will speak of the benefits of robotic or laparoscopic surgery in colorectal cancer. When we, uh, when all this uh, presentations and we will have uh, questions, the thing is that questions can only be received in the chat. And if you have a specific uh, question for a speaker, please address the name of the speaker to the questions. And please don't forget your CMEs. Thank you. Marcus, welcome. Thank you so much, Roger. I think it's, uh, my, it is my, my, my pleasure. It is an honor to be part of this first uh, ESCRS uh, online webinar as a presenter. I think it is a huge privilege to have the opportunity to share with, with you our experience, uh, our job for the last few years, uh, the way we, we approach uh, colon cancer and also, uh, well, some tips, uh, tricks regarding uh, how to do this uh, procedure, which, uh, well, I think will uh, hopefully uh, help you to to understand why we do it and and the reasons why uh, we think it is beneficial for our patients the 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 topic for me today is robotic cme what are the benefits uh, again a huge uh, honor and privilege uh, for me to to be able to share half an hour with you talking about this this great topic it is, I, I think, undoubtedly a, a, a topic of huge interest, and that is uh, becoming, I would say, a, a hot topic in the uh, colorectal uh, surgery field. And hopefully, uh, we will have a great discussion after this this uh, presentation. So, I uh, in Santander, which is a, a small uh, city in the northern part of Spain. The hospital is called uh, University Hospital Valdecilla. It's been in the city for the last 110 years, more or less. And we started our robotic uh, surgery program in the colorectal field in 2010, so more or less 10, 11 years ago. Uh, we've been having two robotic systems uh, in the house from the very beginning. And we updated our technology uh, almost a year, year and a half ago. Uh, and currently, we do have an XI and an X uh, system uh, in our OR, and also an XI system in our training center. That really has allowed us to uh, get a lot of experience in the colorectal uh, robotic surgery field, allowing us to perform not only uh, LAR procedures, but also a lot of uh, colonic resections. In total, we have performed around 1,200 uh, colorectal robotic uh, procedures since 2010, and we have been training people across Europe uh, for the last uh, eight years uh, so far. And this is when I started meeting uh, Dr. Geji, uh, who I, I must say uh, I'm a good friend of, and I, I'm really uh, honored of his friendship. The uh, lecture today will be covering a little bit of the evidence, uh, why we do CME, surgical technique on robotic CME, and then some unpublished data from our center. Regarding the evidence so far, I, I think we all are aware of the national registries that uh, the countries in the northern part, not Nordic part of Europe have, uh, mainly Swedish and Danish registries uh, are great registries regarding uh, colorectal cancer. 
And for the last 10 years, we have ob been observing how the uh, well overall survival after rectal cancer treatment has been improving. Uh, even for the last 34 years, it has been improving greatly. Whereas uh, in the case of, of the colon cancer, the, the increase in, in survival has not been that, that great. That has been uh, repeatedly being reported in different papers uh, published uh, in 2010, in 2013, uh, being a, a constant, the, the improved survival after rectal cancer, whereas uh, after colon cancer uh, treatment, uh, that survival has not increased that, that much. Again, more data coming from uh, them. Uh, highlighting exactly the, the same uh, issue, uh, mentioning that rectal cancer uh, survival improvement uh, for decades has been uh, significantly uh, higher than the improvement uh, in survival in uh, colon cancer. It has uh, made uh, many of us start thinking why this was happening and probably the main reason why is because of uh, a mixture of, of uh, improved surgical technique uh, in the case of uh, TME for rectal cancer with uh, well, MDTs uh, and uh, chemo radiotherapy being used uh, for the treatment of uh, some cases in rectal cancer. Whereas in the case of colon cancer, we didn't have and a structured standardized uh, technique and uh, we didn't have the uh, or we were not using those uh, neoadjuvant treatments that uh, made uh, different uh, surgeons in, in Europe uh, in the uh, decade of the 2000s 2008 in Germany uh, a bit later on in in Denmark to start having a focus on CME surgery uh, with the aim of uh, trying to improve the uh, survival, the oncological outcomes uh, after a right colectomy or a left colon resection for a colon cancer. Some uh, countries like Denmark established uh, a CME uh, surgery program in some of their reference centers. And that has uh, shown uh, the outcomes that were published in 2015 and the outcomes that were published uh, more recently in 2019. This is uh, one of the uh, first papers showing uh, a benefit of CME surgery in patients with stage 1 and 3 uh, coronary carcinoma. And at this stage in 2015, the authors of the group from, from Bertelsen, from the Danish colorectal cancer group, uh, were able to uh, point that there might be a benefit, uh, there might be improved outcomes uh, for patients with uh, colon cancer after uh, CME surgery. Five years later, uh, with the five-year outcome uh, after complete mesocolic excision for right-sided colon cancer, uh, presenting the data in 2019 uh, with a population-based core study, the same authors uh, were able to uh, show, to demonstrate that a complete mesocolic excision uh, had the potential to reduce the risk of recurrence and improve long-term outcomes after a stage uh, disease in between one and three on a right-sided uh, coronary carcinomas. This was probably one of the first uh, publications that really uh, provided some evidence uh, uh, moving us uh, into the direction of uh, using CME as a standard for the treatment in colon cancer. Probably the discussion is still on which are the patients that benefit the most. Is it this benefit because we are able to classify after CME surgery better the stage of the patients? Or is it because it really uh, makes a difference uh, to improve the, the quality of the procedure, to measure the quality of the procedure and to do uh, more uh, central uh, lymphadenectomy in these cases? We have to remember that the uh, principles of CME surgery are uh, 
uh, removing the, the tumor uh, with enough margins, including all the areas uh, affected by the tumor with a safe margin of at least more than five centimeters in both sides, preserving uh, with a embryological dissection the fascia, the mesocolic fascia that surround the, the colon uh, and also performing a central vascular ligation and a lymphanectomy that uh, retrieves all the nodes uh, that uh, drain that, that, that tumor. At the end of the day, all those principles are the ones that either help to better uh, classify these patients and then better understand uh, the, the, the survival that they will have or either helps in really improving the long-term outcomes after uh, these procedures, which I think is still under discussion. We have uh, a paper published uh, this morning, uh, so it cannot be more updated from, uh, and, and well, apologies for the quality of the picture, but it is just a screenshot taken from my laptop uh, early this morning uh, while reviewing the literature. It was published in the European Journal of Surgical Oncology uh, available online since today, and uh, it comes from a Spanish group, uh, a group of good friends that work in the uh, eastern part of, of the country, uh, where they perform a meta-analysis in which they arrive to the same conclusions that the Danish group uh, arrived, that uh, D3 lymphanectomy, which is the way that they call CME with central lymphanectomy, enhances oncological clearance in, in patients with right colon cancer. So, I must say that I think there is clearly an increasing degree of evidence. It usually takes time in surgical uh, techniques to, to show that really uh, it, a, a new surgical technique makes a difference, but I think everything is pointing in the direction of uh, having uh, better oncological outcomes after uh, the use of uh, a CME uh, procedure for uh, colon cancer. So, uh, at a more, I would say, personal level, uh, why are we doing uh, CME surgery in our center? Uh, why did we start uh, more or less, uh, well, in August 2014, uh, doing this kind of procedures? Our, uh, well, one of our, our cases uh, was uh, this, this case with a huge node in the, uh, well, area of the superior mesenteric vessels. I think we can uh, see uh, that node while reviewing the, the images. It is clear that in this case, everybody would be in favor of doing a CME with central lymphanectomy. Otherwise, we will be leaving this node uh, behind. And uh, I think that uh, probably in this case, there is no discussion of uh, the need of a D3 lymphanectomy. This is uh, had a, a well a procedure done a, with a robotic approach, and a, we were able to perform the CME and remove a, and block all the specimen with this a, lymph node. But the the point is, a, well, can we easily identify preoperatively all the patients that might have a benefit that might have? a nodal metastasis uh, in the area of uh, the superior mesenteric vessels. Well, unfortunately, uh, local regional overstaging and understaging uh, after a CT scan or even after a PET scan uh, usually results in an appropriate treatment strategies. That's something that happens in almost 50% of the cases. And that makes us uh, or puts us in a position in which, uh, unfortunately, we cannot really uh, identify the patients that will benefit the most uh, for this surgical technique. So, who is the one that is going to benefit the most? Well, uh, the literature says uh, stages from one to three. That probably gives us a little clue. So, maybe we can only exclude a stage four. The literature mentions uh, younger patients that might have a, a bigger benefit. Well, that is also something that has no no really uh, good evidence support uh, behind it. Of course, in a very elder patient, the the uh, degree of benefit after a, a very uh, aggressive uh, procedure might be a bit smaller. But why not doing it? Because at the at the end of the day, if that patient has a recurrence. We will have difficulties to to rescue uh, him from the or her from the from the oncological disease. 
So I think that the, the uncertainty, the a lack of capability of identifying who will really benefit from this uh, approach and the evidence supporting that in some cases this might add uh, and it looks with the recent evidence that it really adds uh, a value in local recurrence ecological outcomes pushed us to start implementing the technique in in our center the surgical technique uh, with approach, uh, I think it's going to be summarized in different slides and then I will jump into sharing a, a clip which we will try to uh, uh, during 10, 15 minutes uh, look into how we do the procedure with uh, in this particular case with an X uh, surgical system. Before even uh, speaking about the technique, I think it is important to remember that one of the most difficult steps of the procedure is making a central lipidectomy, a section around the superior mesenteric vessels, and having the help of a 3D reconstruction uh, is usually very important in the earlier uh, phases of introducing this technique. If you have if nowadays I do uh, 3D reconstruction in all the cases, my answer will be no. But we did make this uh, 3D vascular reconstruction in all the cases while introducing the technique. So we did uh, make this kind of vascular reconstructions to understand uh, the different uh, anatomical variations that uh, might happen in the uh, right side of the colon. Because as you all uh, are aware of, uh, there are at least four or five different uh, variations of the vascular anatomy in the right side. And making a central vascular ligation in this case, for example, would uh, make us have to uh, divide the artery uh, at this level. That's something that if we don't know that the artery goes behind, that it has a few centimeters behind the, the vein, and that the vascular disposition is this way, we might uh, either leave some uh, tissue behind or either have uh, the, an increased risk of, of uh, vascular injuries. So this is why while introducing this technique, we are very much in favor of recommending uh, doing this uh, planning and this 3D vascular reconstructions. Nowadays, there are plenty of uh, different options uh, that you can even upload uh, good quality CT images to an online based software made a good vascular reconstruction and receive in a couple of days uh, a good 3D uh, image that can help in, in surgical planning. So moving forward with the options we have for, for trocar placement uh, for uh, third generation systems, which are the S and the SI, there are still a good number of these systems being used in the, in the world. Uh, the way we use the, the system and we place the trockers is having the camera trocar in the midpoint of the uh, abdomen, uh, two centimeters to the left uh, side of the patient. Uh, we use uh, number one. Uh, level of a uh, well uh, subcostal left subcostal margin uh, more or less at the level where it crosses with the uh, mid clavicular line around eight centimeters from the from the camera number two goes in the same line as as one also eight centimeters uh, away from the from the camera trocar Assistant trocar goes around a couple of centimeters uh, to the left of this mid clavicular line at the same level of the camera. And uh, number three uh, usually goes uh, in a mirror image of two, a bit, a uh, couple of centimeters below. Number three will have a double fenestrated instrument working most of the time in this axis pulling the small bowel and uh, or, or pulling the area of the transverse column uh, cranially. And the surgeon will be working with his left hand in number one, usually a monopolar scissor and left hand in number two, usually uh, bipolar fenestrated. With four generation systems, uh, which are X and XI Da Vinci surgical systems, we have uh, two different options, what we call the uh, lateral approach and what we call the suprapubic approach. 
We started using the latter approach in most of our cases because probably because we were used to, to use the third generation system, which almost forced us to do that uh, latter approach. But now we have moved to a, a supracubic approach, which is what you will see in the clip in a couple of minutes. The trocar placement for the latter approach has number one uh, for XI at the mid uh, point of the area where the final steel incision will be made. Number four, three centimeters below the subcostal margin at the level of the left mid clavicular line. A line in between one and four is made, divided the distance by three, and with that number, we uh, made the calculations needed to place two and three. A system usually goes in between two and three, and the stapler uh, choker uh, we use is usually number three in order to have good access uh, for dividing the ileum, good access to divide the transverse uh, colon, and good access for the intracoperastomosis. The system is stuck perpendicular from the right side of the abdomen in the case of the XI. If it is the X, usually it should be perpendicular to the axis uh, or to the line uh, of the chokers. For a suprapuvic approach, usually uh, we use final steel uh, line and we uh, move it a bit higher up. If you see both images, this one has the, the line a bit higher up. Uh, in between those two, like uh, three, four centimeters from the midline, we are going to place trockers two and three, and uh, trockers four and one are going to be placed around six centimeters in the same line from one and four. If the patient is a small in size, doesn't have a very wide pelvis, then one and four are pushed up a couple of centimeters, making kind of a smile shape uh, trocar placement with one, two, and three and four. Assistant is placed three, two, three centimeters uh, at the midpoint of the abdomen lateral to the uh, left side of the of the mid clavicular line, and usually a, a stapler trocar is number four in order to help us uh, do the uh, transection of the alum, transection of the transverse colon, and also intracorporeal anastomosis. So again, this is the way now you will see the procedure, the way we we system in the way we are doing most of our procedures. And we see some benefit in doing it the way we do it with an inferior approach in order to perform a dissection below the, the ileum, below the right column mesentery, expose the head of the pancreas, expose the, the duodenum, and then go for the vascular dissection. With the XI system, as we were mentioning, Options. This is the way the system will be docked. Uh, if it is uh, used for a, a lateral approach, patient positioning is with head down, usually a slight uh, left uh, down, but most of it is, is uh, head down uh, in trend and work position. And for the uh, super pubic uh, approach, uh, the idea is exactly the, the same. For uh, the X, uh, we usually position the system uh, perpendicular to the line of the trockers, as you say, as you see here, and the patient is also positioned head down with left down. And for the superfluvic approach with the X system, the system should be uh, rotated a little bit towards the head of the patient, entering in an almost perpendicular, like a, a, I would say, a 80, 75 degree angle from the patient axis uh, towards the, the area of the of the trocar placements. The way we do the technique uh, in a step-by-step -step approach is uh, inferior approach, uh, subelial dissection, then uh, central vascular uh, dissection and ligation of ileocolic vessels, a section of the middle colic vessels, divide the right branch of the middle colic, uh, then dissect the Henle trunk and divide the colic branch of the Henle trunk, also known as the superior colic uh, vein, and then uh, perform the mobilization of the hepatic flexure, divide the bowel, perform the anastomosis, and extract the specimen through a fan steel incision. As uh, you will see here, we will focus mainly in the four, uh, first four uh, points and the anastomosis during the, the, the clip.
uh, well, as you see here, this is the way we, we position the, the patient in the OR. Most of the tubes come from the right side of the patient, go to the left side, where is the suction and the insufflation. We measure, we take as reference cephoid pubis, uh, cephoid process pubis, both, uh, uh, well, spine, supra, uh, superior, upper spines, and then like five centimeters, six centimeters uh, over the pubis, uh, we draw this uh, line and then uh, like four centimeters from the midline uh, on the left and right side, we place two and three. For the X system, usually it is um, the, placed in a way in which uh, trochars are placed as one, two, three, and four. Uh, so this is two, three, one, and four. If we do it the other way around, sometimes might have some some issues uh, with collisions with with four and one, which is the way. You see here how we have done the the trend number, how we have the down the left down, and now we are uh, positioning the table down and uh, moving the card and docking the system. So as as mentioned, first step uh, procedure is to. Well, place the the uh, you see a huge bulky tumor here in the uh, ascending column, and uh, we have this patient with head down position. We are moving the small bowel towards the the head of the patient, so we have good access uh, of the uh, area of the duodenum of the cava vein and and the let's call it the posterior phase of the alveolar mesentery and right column mesentery. So you see. Uh, we start to see here duodenum. Uh, also, even in this case, because it was a thin patient, we can see observe the the alcoholic or the mesenteric vessels. We start uh, our dissection in uh, arm number four. You see, we are working with the um, monopolar scissors, hot shears. We have in our trocar number two the uh, bipolar uh, fenestrated, and in number one a TPAP that is pulling, helping us to pull the mesentery higher up. We usually start our dissection uh, at the level of the duodenum, open the, the peritoneum. One of the benefits of this inferior approach is we don't need to really divide the mesentery to enter in the plane, uh, which is something that we uh, traditionally had to do with the uh, medial to lateral approach. In this case, that is not needed because uh, the, the mesentery just uh, finishes down there. We are just putting up the mesentery. We have in a special care here because the Ilocolics, the mesenteric vessels are just uh, very close in this area, uh, exposing the, the duodenum and exposing very soon uh, the uh, head of the of the pancreas. You see how I mean how thing it is using this extra arm uh, placed in in trocar number one in this case to pull up the the mesentery and allow us to perform the the dissection here. We will a few minutes. We are now uh, dissecting in between uh, the vessels and uh, the uh, head of the pancreas. Uh, there is a fascia here called, uh, also known as the, the Fred's fascia. You can see that fascia just uh, below the scissors now in this, this line we have here. And uh, this is a, a fascia we uh, should just leave uh, below. Uh, which covers uh, the head of the pancreas. You see how nicely we are uh, moving down the, the Frederick's fascia while uh, removing all the uh, tissue uh, involving the, the uh, mesocolic fascia. So it's a fusion of fascias here. Uh, and now we are reaching the, the root of the, of the helmet trunk, which we will uh, see a bit better in a in few seconds. And at that level is where we usually stop the dissection of the of this uh, inferior approach, uh, because it's where uh, things uh, might start to get uh, more tricky. As we have the pancreatic branch of the hand trunk uh, just in in this area, we usually help ourselves with uh, this small uh, gauze that helps us to uh, make more traction without injuring the uh, vessels. And again, uh, you see how we are pulling down all the all the mesentery. Uh, sorry, the the on the the head of the pancreas and pulling up all the mesentery following the planes. In this case, because of the huge bulky tumor, uh, we even remove a little bit of the retroperitoneum, uh, but of course kept the the 
fascia, mesocolic fascia, together with the, with the specimen uh, all the time. So next uh, step is uh, making the, the dissection at the level of the um, iliocolix uh, and at the level of the superior mesenteric vein. Uh, this is uh, where we start the dissection, usually on top of the ileal branch of the superior mesenteric vein. Iliocolix are pushed up here by the assistant. Uh, we are pulling up uh, from the middle colix with our uh, instrument in, in arm number one, and we are starting our dissection along the ileal branch uh, of uh, the superior mesenteric vein. This is uh, the way the, the branch goes, and this is where it gets together with the uh, last uh, jejunal branch, uh, which goes in this area. All this uh, is a drainage, a lymphatic drainage area of the um, uh, tumors that are located in the cecum or in the ascending column. So uh, the traditional practice of uh, going just below the ileocolic vessels uh, does or might have a, a, an increased risk of, of having a, a recurrence in this area. Of course, this just might happen in one, three percent of the cases, but the point is, do we know which are those cases? Can we improve the outcomes by, uh, well, limiting the, the risk in those cases? Uh, I would say the answer is, is yes, if we perform uh, this approach. Here, we are speeding up the, the clip a little bit. I've identified the earlier branch, the vein, the artery, and we have started our dissection along the superior mesenteric vein. Uh, the inferior approach allowed us to perform this uh, posterior dissection initially, which I think is quite helpful in order to uh, have more traction in this area and safely perform the dissection of the, of the vessels. Again, uh, speeding up a little bit, we are moving uh, cranially, we have a uh, good exposure of the anterior face of the uh, superior mesenteric vein. You have this uh, fascia covering the vein sticky tissue that usually allows us to follow uh, the dissection along the, the superior mesenteric vein with uh, almost uh, a, a blunt uh, dissection. And we to dissect the ileocolic vessels uh, which are being exposed here in this area. As I mentioned, we use uh, arm uh, one to have good exposure of the middle colics here and uh, well, uh, allow us also to, to have a, a clear view of, of those vessels. In some cases, if we want to have better exposure, we first uh, dissect the ileocolics so we can start uh, moving, mobilizing a little bit of the lymphatic tissue covering the, the upper part of the superior mesenteric vein. In this case, in the CT scan, we could see some uh, nodes. We are observing them in this area of the image, another one here. And also, that's another reason why we, we were more uh, well uh, willing to, to, to make a, a central uh, dissection here. We will speed a little bit this up. And here we are performing the division of the right branch uh, of, the, of the middle colic. They uh, have been uh, partially dissected. So now we have good exposure of the right branch of the middle colic, and we are exposing uh, completely the ileal colics. You see how we have here uh, a posterior uh, arterial branch and an anterior uh, venous branch. We are now performing a section of the of the vessels, and uh, we dividing them with this uh, hemolog. Uh, usually, we prefer to uh, perform the uh, dissection and uh, ligation of the ileocolic uh, vessels that are anterior first. Uh, anterior means uh, uh, higher up and, and posterior uh, later, though uh, this vein might be a bit more cranial than the artery. Uh, we perform the, the dissection and the ligation first of the vein because it is anterior compared with the, with the artery. That allows us now to perform a little bit of dissection posterior to the vein and a central vascular ligation of the ileocolic artery uh, with it uh, fully skeletonized. We will towards, uh, well, you see here how we have already divided the right branch of the middle colic, we 
enter in the uh, space uh, of the lesser sac here, identifying the body of the pancreas. This is the direction where this uh, SMB goes. And now we are dissecting the, in this case, uh, the colic uh, was an independent right colic. So we had to divide it independently at the, and the uh, colic branch of the Henle uh, was uh, independent also a bit uh, to, the, to the right side. So we are dividing here. We have divided the colic branch of the Henle. We are dividing the, the uh, this middle colic, uh, which was a right branch independent, and then we are mobilizing fully the area of the head of the pancreas and the gastrocolic vessels. Just to to complete a little bit the the procedure, see how we perform the vascular assessment with ICG. Usually we use in between five and seven point five milligrams of ICG to assess the, the perfusion, divide with a, a 60 millimeter stapler, I, both sides, the uh, colon, the ileum, also assess the perfusion in the, in the ileum, and then uh, perform, a, a, well, intercorporeal anastomosis, stitching the ileum with the colon, uh, first to have good exposure using instrument in number one, then uh, make an enterotomy in the transverse colon and in the ileum, and uh, after uh, using the stapler to perform a uh, side to side isoperistaltic ileocolic uh, anastomosis, we perform the, the suturing, which usually is performed uh, from down to up, uh, from posterior to anterior, as this area might be the, the most challenging one. This is the, the kind of, of specimens we, we have with the full uh, mesocolic fascia and with the D3 area preserved, preserving completely the duodenal window. They are not a, a C shape, they have a, a rectangular shape. And I think that that is what gives us the, the outcomes that we are having. The um, uh, data uh, comes from a review of all our cases in between 2010 and 2019, including uh, different uh, aspects of demographic, interoperative, postoperative outcomes, and oncological outcomes, uh, while well, uh, studying both laparoscopic and robotic right colectomies with intracorporeal and extracorporeal anastomosis. In total, since uh, 2010, we have performed uh, almost 400 cases until December 2019. Uh, with robotic approach, we have performed 167 right colectomies and uh, looking to the data, uh, including lab and robotic, we have much better uh, results, outcomes with the intracorporeal anastomosis uh, technique with shorter hospital stair, shorter complications and shorter wound infection. And looking precisely on the topic, uh, looking to the D3 uh, versus D2, so CME versus non-CME cases, we observe uh, the same degree of complications with no significant statistical difference in the postoperative period when comparing the D3 and non-D3 cases we had in the, in the past. So in our case, D3 lymphanectomy does not increase the postoperative complication rate. It does increase with statistical significance the number of lymph nodes we are retrieving, almost 10 lymph nodes more per specimen in all the ages and in both uh, genders, female and male. And though we uh, still don't have a statistical significance, significance in local recurrence uh, rates, we do see, observe a trend towards less local recurrence uh, with the CME with D3 infanectomy group. Uh, and also we do see uh, a trend towards less, uh, uh, well, a longer survival uh, after D3 uh, lymphanectomy. So our data uh, looks similar to what is uh, published in the literature. So concluding, we think that robotic approach really makes feasible CME and CME together with intercorporeal anastomosis, which is the way we, we do it, really is associated with low complication rates, low wound infections, and also might have an impact in decreasing local recurrence and improving oncological uh, outcomes. Thank you so much uh, for, for listening and, and looking forward to the discussion uh, later on. Thank you so much, Marcus, for a wonderful presentation. I love your movies. While uh, Fayek is uh, preparing his presentation, uh, please, all the participants, if you have questions, write them in the chat and we'll uh, go through them in the end of the webinar. Uh, Fine, it's your turn. I'm very anxious to hear the uh, latest about uh, 
rectal cancer. Thank you very much. This has been a true pleasure. Um, and my talk and my task is talk about the management of rectal cancer. And you asked me to do two things. You asked me to cover the new guidelines with regards to management and to talk a little bit about the robotic surgical technique in this regard. So in the management of rectal cancer, the current standard is well known. It's preoperative chemoradiotherapy followed by surgery, and then patients get adjuvant chemotherapy. And this is based on a lot of published data that have established preoperative chemoradiotherapy as the standard of care. These are the key landmark trials, the German trial, the NSABP R03, and the RTOG 9401, all of which has shown a decrease in local recurrence in the preoperative arm by almost half, and a decrease in the toxicities when the chemoradiotherapy is given pre-op. However, recently, as we talk about shifting guidelines and shifting approaches to the management of rectal cancer, there have been three major shifts that are happening. I'm going to call them paradigm shifts. Paradigm shift number one focuses on the more selective use of neoadjuvant radiotherapy. And the reason for that is very clear. If you look at all the trials that have compared the outcomes, the addition of radiotherapy has not resulted in an improvement in survival. It has only resulted in an improvement in local control. We also know that preoperative radiotherapy results in a bit of a worse function. And erectile and sexual function is worse when you give patient preoperative radiotherapy when you compare it with surgery alone. And if you look at the low anterior resection syndrome, it is in the range of 27% after surgery alone, but increases up to 80% when you combine preoperative chemoradiotherapy with surgery. So this is to say that preoperative radiotherapy is not without its side effects. So can we avoid neoadjuvant radiotherapy in some select patients? What we agree on is that stage one tumors Tumors that are higher than 12 centimeter or above the peritoneal reflection clearly do not need radiotherapy. I think the paradigm shift that we are talking about is now looking at patients with T3A or B, clinically N0, tumors of the mid-rectum when the, when the radial margin is not threatened, meaning that you have a radial margin clearance of 2 to 5 millimeter by preoperative MRI. And when you look at the studies that have looked at this, you can see that the risk of recurrence in this subgroup of patients when they're done with proper surgery is extremely low. And this is again from the Dutch TME study, looking at the group of patients that did not receive radiotherapy, the three-year local recurrence when you have a good CRM is in the range of 6%, equal to what you get with chemoradiotherapy with a very significant peak. And these were included in the ASTRO guidelines, looking at the appropriate utilization of radiotherapy. And here I'm gonna share with you patients with stage two and three rectal cancer in the intermediate risk group, meaning T1, T2, N1 disease, or T3, N0 disease. And you can see here in yellow that it may be appropriate to skip uh, radiotherapy in this subgroup of patients. Paradigm shift number two, that happened, I think, in the last, been evolving in the last five years, but has recently become a standard of care and adopted into the CCN guidelines, is the concept of total neoadjuvant therapy. So instead of giving the patient chemoradiotherapy followed by surgery, the total neoadjuvant therapy combines both the chemoradiotherapy and the systemic chemotherapy before surgery. Why do we think about TNE? Well, because more patients are going to complete the chemotherapy when it's given preoperatively, because you will get a higher rate of pathologic complete response rate, which may result in improved survival. This will also facilitate surgical resection, lead patients with a shorter time with an ileostomy, and in some patients where you are considering organ preservation, increase your ability to offer an organ preservation strategy. So there are clear benefits for total neoadjuvant therapy. One of the key landmark papers is the Prodige 23 uh, study, which is a randomized phase three trial. And here what they did is they uh, took patients with T3, T4 rectal cancer, and they randomized them to chemoradiotherapy and surgery, which is the standard arm, what we have always done. 
versus chemotherapy followed by chemoradiotherapy followed by surgery. This is a randomized trial. And here you could see that the uh, combination chemotherapy had a very significant excellent three-year disease-free and metastasis-free survival with very significant p-value, so there was an improvement. And if you look at tumor regression, you could see a significant improvement as well in tumor regression. So very significant improvement in survival and very significant improvement in response rate. And so they demonstrated the feasibility of adding neoadjuvant chemotherapy to the chemoradiotherapy to increase the PCR, to increase the probability of achieving curative surgery, disease-free survival, and metastasis-free survival. And the investigators concluded that this should be a new standard of care for the management of T3, T4 rectal cancer. And paradigm shift number three now involves the introduction or the return to short course radiotherapy. So the debate about short course versus long course radiotherapy has existed for a long time. But if you really look at the data objectively, there have been two randomized trials that have compared the preoperative short course with the long course, both of which showed decreased rate of acute toxicity, 18 versus 3%, 28 versus 2%, and no statistical significant differences in overall survival, local recurrence, sphincter preservation, and late toxicity. So the short course really has very strong data supporting it. And the concept that we have seen now moving forward is basically instead of giving chemo radiotherapy and delayed surgery, the traditional short course was short course followed by immediate surgery. And now the new concept is short course followed by delayed surgery, just like we delay in the conventional chemo radiotherapy. So instead of giving short course and then five days later operating on those patients, we give short course and we give them chemo and then we operate on. So this is exactly the new paradigm that we're talking about. And this was tested in the Rapido trial. And the Rapido trial uh, basically is exactly that. This is conventional uh, chemo radiotherapy. This is the standard five and a half weeks, followed by 18, eight weeks, and then surgery. Then the patients got their systemic chemotherapy. The experimental arm gave them the short course radiotherapy, followed by six cycles of chemotherapy or nine cycles of Folpox or six of Kpox, depending, an average of 18 weeks. And then the patients got their surgery. And in this trial, you could see that in the arm that got the systemic, the short course radiotherapy plus chemo, the response rate, pathologic complete response rate was doubled to about 30% with a very significant p value, with a drop in disease free, disease related failure, and a drop in distant metastasis, all of which achieve very high significance. So 7% lower disease treatment failure, 7% lower metastasis, doubling of the PCR rate. So if you're considering a watch and wait, then that's what you want to do and no unexpected toxicity. And this is the actual paper that was published in Lancet Oncology in December 7, 2020. And here you are looking at the overall survival and disease-free survival, and you can clearly see a, a hazard ratio of 0.75 with a very significant p-value, very distinct curves in favor of short course radiotherapy followed by systemic chemotherapy and a total neoadjuvant therapy approach. And the uh, also uh, authors put forth the claim that the experimental treatment is now a new standard of care in high risk locally advanced rectal cancer. So we now have two standards of care in high risk uh, rectal cancer. And this has been reflected in the NCCN guidelines. This is the 2021 version of the NCCN guidelines. And if you have a patient with T3 or node, uh, node well, any N with a threatened or involved CRM, they have actually three options. They have the standard chemo radiotherapy option. They have the chemo uh, therapy followed by chemo radiotherapy. And then they have the short course radiotherapy followed by chemotherapy. All of those options are available to our patients. All of them are acceptable by NCCN guidelines. And then we have to make judicious use of all these technologies for the treatment of our patients. So this is this the first part of my talk was really focusing on on the change in the guidelines and the management of rectal cancer. 
The second part, I am going to talk a little bit about how to approach patients with rectal cancer. And, and, and if you look at what is out there, you can see that there are a lot of different approaches for rectal cancer, open, laparoscopic, robotic, up to down, down to up, CATI-ME, single port. And so you can see that surgeons have been on a quest uh, to really figure out what is the optimal treatment. Uh, and you will see very strong opinions on what is the best approach when you talk to different surgeons about this. What I'm going to tell you is it doesn't matter to me how you do your operation. It matters to me that you get a good outcome. And how do, you, how do we judge the quality of the surgical resection? We judge the quality by looking at margins, both the distal margin and the circumferential margin, by looking at the mesorectal grade and by looking at the lymph node lead. Those are objective criteria to measure a good surgery. And this is an example of what your, the quality of your specimen should look like on pathology, additional images of what the complete mesorectal excision should look like. If we look at what is happening across uh, Europe, you could see that you know laparoscopic surgery started when I was a fellow back 20 years ago. And 20 years later today, if you see the rate of laparoscopic rectal resection in the UK, it's in the range of 60%. In Europe, it ranges from 30 to 80%. 30 to 80%. And the conversion rate is anywhere from 10 to 15%. We have some interesting data that shows this is a January 6 paper that was published. This is the Mayo Clinic group looking at experience with robotic surgery. And you can see that the percent utilization of robotic surgery has increased from 5% in 2013 to the range of 20% now in, in 2018, and those numbers continue to increase. So why is robotics increasing and taking off in the field of rectal cancer? I will submit to you that there are several benefits of robotic surgery. Um, I've listed them here, and I will provide you the evidence as we go forward. But robotic surgery will give you improved nerve preservation and sexual function improved R0 resection, decreased conversion rate, and potentially improved oncologic outcome. We'll begin with the first one, which is improved nerve preservation. I'm not going to talk about the image stability and dexterity because these are, I think, talked about a lot. I'm going to talk about the evidence. So as we, we mentioned a little bit earlier, what the low anterior resection syndrome is, which is a syndrome of disordered bowel function, after surgery and chemo radiotherapy, resulting in a detriment to the quality of life. And it combines a variety of symptoms that include frequency, fragmentation, bloating, IBS symptoms, urgency, and incontinence. And after chemo radiotherapy and low anterior resection, the, the rate of LARS is quite high. It ranges anywhere from 40 to 90%, depending on what study you look at. And there are some risk factors for the low anterior resection, such as the type of anastomosis, whether you do a straight versus a pouch, where the anastomosis is, if a leak happens, and if the patient received evo radiotherapy. But I think we have to look at whether surgical technique also has an impact. And if you look at uh, robotic versus laparoscopic, what is published in the literature, you can see that there are a number of studies that suggests that there is less anorectal dysfunction after robotic total mesorectal excision, although these are not randomized and the level of evidence here is only three to four. Um, an additional uh, meta-analysis that was performed by Dr. Grass from the University Hospital of Hamburg, which is currently submitted for publication and which I'm sharing uh, this data with his permission, shows that uh, in a, in a meta-analysis of 5,000 patients, uh, there is an improvement in low anterior resection syndrome in the subgroup of patients. So the second thing that I want to share with you is the improved R0 resection and the negative margin rate. And if you look here at the completeness of the total of the mesorectum in laparoscopic versus robotic, and this is a meta-analysis that was published in the International Journal of Colorectal Disease in 2019, you can see that the odds ratio favors robotic in terms of completeness of the mesorectum. And if you look at historical uh, series in terms of uh, uh, convention, uh, the, the rate of mesorectal positivity, again, if you look at the classic and the color trial, you have a 10 to 15 percent rate of positivity. If you look at the various series that are published uh, uh, of CRM positivity in rectal cancer, you can clearly see that these values are significantly lower than the historical series of the classic, the color, 
and the COVID trials. Let's look a little bit at the, about the conversion rate with robotic versus laparoscopic. And the challenge, as you know, is the deep pelvis. The deep pelvis is the most anatomically difficult part of the rectum. It has a, it's low in the pelvis. There's frequently narrowing of the pelvis in that area because of the anterior presence of the prostate and the bulky mesorectum that's sitting in your way, as well as the anterior deflection of the rectum and its distal part. And because of this challenge, conversion rates have traditionally been very, very high. And if you look at the historical series, the classic, the color, and what have you, the conversion rates were, and this is real-time data from randomized international recognized trials. Look at the conversion rates, 17 to 34% conversion rate in the laparoscopy arm. Quite high. Well, if you look at the robotic conversion rate, you're going to see that this robotic conversion rate is significantly lower in all of the published series that, uh, and trials comparing to their historical controls. This is, um, again, if, uh, a very similar uh, paper that shows you, um, uh, and this, uh, it's a busy slide, but it shows basically the same thing. And this is, again, looking at the, uh, in the Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery, the influence of conversion. Uh, on the outcome, you could see that um, uh, the conversion in robotic is significantly better than versus laparoscopic and versus open. Um, and a similar, again, a meta-analysis uh, by Dr. Fan and colleagues also showing similar results with results that are in favor of the robotic approach in terms of conversion. And this is what I showed you before. And uh, finally, the data that's coming from David Larson and, and the Mayo Clinic group, also uh, historically looking at uh, the NSQIP data between comparing laparoscopic and robotic. This was again published very recently from 2013 to 2018. And you can consistently see that the rate of conversion in the robotic arm is significantly lower than the rate of conversion in the laparoscopic arm. So, Finally, there is a hint in a couple of publications that are looking at improved oncological outcomes. And this is uh, a paper that was published in the Disease of Colon Rectum in 2017, Single Center Experience, um, uh, looking at long term survival. And in this uh, particular uh, study, although the results, the, the numbers are relatively low and the P is not significant, you could demonstrate that there is perhaps a trend in favor of robotic surgery. Um, and more recently, uh, in a, a comparative study that was published again by Dr. Khan and his group in the International Journal of Colorectal Disease, they suggest, uh, again, an advantage in terms of survival for the robotic TME arm compared to their historical laparoscopic TME results. And so I'll submit to you basically that uh, robotic surgery is, in, in, in fact, better surgery and therefore it can give you better outcomes in uh, the field of uh, rectal cancer. And I will uh, summarize in the following by saying that rectal cancer really must be managed um, in centers with the appropriate multidisciplinary expertise involving experts from surgery, radi radi radiology, GI, medical, and radiation oncology. That total knee adjuvant therapy is a new standard of care in the management of rectal cancer. That the quality of the surgery is an important determinant of local recurrence and improvement in overall survival and that the robotic platform in rectal cancer surgery is associated with improved uh, surgical outcomes, reducing low anterior resection syndrome, reducing margin positivity, reducing conversion rate, and improving survival. With the remainder of my time, I'd like to take a few minutes to go over a, a 10 minute video that describes the various technical aspects and the approach to uh, rectal cancer. Um, if you uh, would kindly share the video. So, um, I, I started immediately with the rectal part. Nobody wants to see the IMA and stuff. So the dissection um, uh, starts usually in the posterior plane, and here you can see the bilobed appearance of the uh, mesorectum. Uh, here you can see on the right the um, hypogastric nerve, which is a nerve that we would like to uh, preserve. And uh, you can clearly see uh, the plane of dissection. A little bit choppy, and I apologize about that, but I usually will start on the posterior plane, but I think some experts prefer to start in the anterior plane, and that's something that we can discuss later uh, in the discussion part as to what's the best way to approach. So posteriorly, you can see that it's a, the, the, the robotic arm is very powerful, and it helps you elevate uh, the rectum up and create this posterior plane easily. 
once you have uh, created the posterior plane, then uh, I think we can shift uh, to the left and to the right. Uh, and here you can see that my assistant who's got the suction in his hand is doing a lousy job because it's quite smoky. <laughs> I apologize about that. So this is the uh, lateral uh, approach now. Having done the uh, posterior approach, um, you can see that it's like opening a book. Basically, you use the robotic arms in order to give you the traction and the counter traction and to expose the plane that you want to get into. Um, you shift uh, in, in a circle, uh, circumferentially, and uh, this is an approach to the anterior plane here. And then you can take that over to the right as well. And you can see that the uh, traction that the robotic arm can give you and the stable visualization is what's giving you an eye follow. I'm seeing the video a little bit choppy. I'm assuming everyone is seeing that a little bit choppy as well. Well, the latter, the latter part of the video is going to focus on the anterior dissection, but I wanted to show this part because I think this is something that I did not used to see in laparoscopy, which is a very clear definition of de novidier fascia. And here you can see the de novidier fascia that you can clearly see when you're doing this approach robotically, something that I almost never really had a good view of when I did this, when I did a low anterior dissection laparoscopically. Uh, when you reach the middle uh, rectal vessels, you can uh, divide them. And usually once you divide the middle rectal vessels, it is a straight and clear shot uh, down towards the, the low pelvis. So the middle rectal vessels are here. And in this particular case, I think we'll be able to see here the takeoff of the pedicle, the, the S2, S3, S4 nerves. And you can see the pedicle in this here. And that's something you want to try to avoid in order not to give your patient sexual dysfunction. So this is, again, something that I am not used to seeing in laparoscopy, but I can certainly see a lot better uh, using a robotic uh, platform. And, and the similar dissection is now carried out on the right. I, I prefer to use the hook. Some people use the scissor. Um, I think that it's primarily monopolar cautery for the most part. I have a bipolar in my left hand, but I almost rarely use it. And again, one here you can see the hypogastric nerve, which we want to stay away from. And you're going to see the S2, S3 nerve roots coming up in the lateral um, dissection. Again, here you can see the middle um, rectal vessels, which are not present in everyone. And once you divide the middle rectal vessels, it's usually a pretty clear straight shot into the pelvis um, because the, the tissue planes open up quite nicely once you divide the middle rectal vessels. In the last part uh, of the video, uh, we're going to switch to the anterior approach. So this will be a slightly uh, different video. This is to focus a little bit more on the anterior dissection, and I want to show this a little bit better. This is a male uh, pelvis, so we are going to see, again, uh, how to approach the anterior dissection. You can see here the seminal vesicles that are coming up, and you can see the clear visualization that is given to you by the robotic platform, the stability, and the ability to uh, dissect and identify the proper tissue plane. And this traction and counter traction that you have along with the stable image allows you to clearly see the plane. Uh, and here, this is Denovidier again, that we talked about. And uh, in this, you, you have to make a choice whether you want to go above Denovidier or below Denovidier. Above Denovidier is usually what I choose in case of an anterior tumor, but you have to be aware that you are going to have a higher risk of sexual dysfunction. If the tumor is posterior, then I will typically go below the novelia fascia in order to minimize the risk of rectal uh, dysfunction. Here you can see we are past the seminal vesicles, and we are now dissecting in the plane between the rectum and the prostate. And um, you can see that the traction that is allowed, that is um, generated by the robotic arms is quite significant and allows you to open up this plane and to be able to see as well, so here you can see we are now dissecting off of the prostate um, with uh, pushing the uh, rectum down and proceeding in the anterior plane um, in order to reach all the way down to the pelvic floor. And you can see the pelvic floor opening up uh, very shortly and reaching the pelvic floor. And in the end of the uh, dissection, when you look, you can elevate, you can see the prostate up in the air and you're all the way down to the uh, pelvic floor. I think one of the main advantages of the robotic platform 
is the ability to approach lymph nodes such as this one, which is in the left obturator canal. And these we see them sometimes in patients. Uh, and so when you see a patient like this with a, with a, with a lymph node uh, that is present preoperatively and that did not shrink, and remained after uh, chemo radiotherapy, or even if it disappeared, I will tend to approach this. And the robotic platform allows you the ability to proceed in the lateral pelvic compartment and be able to perform a lateral pelvic lymphadenectomy. And so this is a, a patient who uh, had a uh, obturator lymph node uh, that did not respond to new adjuvant therapy. She had no metastatic disease. She was young. And uh, this is basically the approach to the lateral pelvis on the left side for this patient. So we uh, start by identifying the inferior vesicle artery, and then we stay close to the uh, uh, vessels here. You have the external iliac artery and vein, and we will proceed down taking the obturator lymph nodes until we identify the obturator nerve. So here you can see we're elevating the lymph node packet from behind the vein. And we will identify the obturator nerve very shortly. And once we identify the obturator nerve, we will proceed with the dissection of the obturator uh, canal. Here's the obturator nerve. You can see it, it's been uh, visualized and dissected. And uh, we are going to proceed with the dissection of the uh, lymph nodes in the obturator canal on the left side. A lot of this can be done bluntly with a little bit of bipolar cautery as needed, as you can see here. And uh, so uh, we uh, complete uh, the apex of this uh, dissection here. At the apex, I will uh, place a hemolock clip in order to minimize uh, lymph leak uh, following this procedure into the pelvis. So here we're completing the obturator lymph and anectomy removing all of the lymph nodes in the obturator triangle. And there, there are occasionally some small bridging vessels such as this um, dental vein, which I will, you know, as, if they can be preserved, I'll tend to preserve them. Uh, and pass the specimen from underneath. And this is, you know, this is the, the beautiful stable view and the articulation that, that allows you to do uh, this type of dissection. So here we're completing uh, the obturator lymphadenectomy, and now we're going to go in and do the internal iliac lymphadenectomy. After this uh, is completed, the specimen is placed um, on the right on the right hand side on top of the rectal specimen. And now we're going to go back and we're going to, so we did the left lateral compartment and now we're going to go to the medial compartment and here you can see the obturator fascia and the obturator muscle down on the pelvic floor with the iliac vessels on the right. And we are going to retrieve the lymph node packet that is in this uh, triangle. Once again, at the apex of this lymph node packet at the pelvic floor, we will place a hemolock as needed and we will continue the dissection and retrieval of all of those lymph nodes. And this is the uh, apex of the triangle, uh, and this completes the uh, pelvic lymphadenectomy in this patient. Now, this is not something that I do routinely at all. I will only do this very, very selectively, and in patients who uh, really have uh, demonstrated disease in the lateral compartment and who otherwise have no evidence of metastatic or systemic disease, respond well to new adjuvant therapy, uh, and, and uh, therefore deserve a, a, the best optimal surgical treatment. So this is just an extraction of the lymph node specimen. I think the video will end very shortly. So uh, with this, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, again, questions in the end. So we uh, welcome uh, Shafi Sidani. Are you ready? 
Uh, Thank you, Roger. What is the best? What is the best option? Is it robotic or laparoscopic approach for CRC? Tell me. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, thanks, Roger. Thanks for uh, congratulations to Eskers and uh, thank you, Sara and Zach here for putting this together. Thanks to Nagy for uh, helping sponsor this. Um, so these are my disclosures. So basically what I'm going to talk about is um, more of kind of specifically the benefit of robotics over laparoscopy and colorectal surgery in general. I think the previous previous speakers went over some of that. Um, we'll show you more of that um, to do with uh, more of colectomies, ve uh, ventral rectopexy, some miscellaneous applications. We'll do some cost analysis and address some of the criticisms that people have about robotic surgery. So I'm sorry I have to um, share these videos, each one specifically, just to uh, make them run uh, smoother. So it's going to take a little time and disruption. And guys, let me know if you don't see them. So uh, to start with, I wanted to share, uh, start with a couple of video clips to show you, do you if you see them, if you don't see them, let me know. Uh, this is a really challenging case, a ventral rectopexy on an old man with 30 years of rectal prolapse, really huge rectal prolapse uh, for 30 years. You can see how bulky and big the rectum is and how deep the pelvis and tight it is with a hanging prostate. This is after we've done the anterior dissection. Um, and the uh, and we're placing the mesh showing in place. Um, you can see the benefits of robotics in this uh, particular case where we can sew with both hands. Um, it's much easier to move the camera in and out by you, the surgeon. Uh, you can retract with the one instrument and use two other instruments and your assistant. Uh, this really stable, really easy to sew and tie with these wristed instruments um, in tight spaces. Uh, in my hands, this would be really hard laparoscopically, doable, but hard. I think with the robot, you can see how much benefit you get technically um, and how much better you can do it. Um, I think, you know, the easier cases, of course, are easily doable uh, laparoscopically, but to be to, to do this better with the challenging cases, I think robotics is the way to go. Uh, and to be able to do the hard cases, you need to do the um, easy cases too. Uh, let me just go back to, uh, this is just another brief video, I'll leave it as is. Uh, it's basically uh, a periaortic lymph node that's left over right on the aorta after dividing the uh, IMA just off the, um, just at the takeoff. And you can see how much easier it is to dissect something like this with the robot as opposed to laparoscopy. Again, doable laparoscopy, but you do a nicer job, I think, with um, the precision of the robot. Um, that was a negative lymph node, by the way. So if we go back to laparoscopy and colorectal surgery, I think the first case was reported uh, of a laparoscopic colectomy in 1990. Um, and since then, the data has shown that it improves perioperative outcomes, costs, length of stay, um, compared to open with generally uh, equivalent uh, oncologic outcomes. There are difficulties, however, and I think most of us have um, been through these difficulties, the technical ones with laparoscopy, especially in the challenging cases. Most laparoscopy has a two-dimensional view with a camera, and that can be difficult to learn. Uh, your assistant's usually controlling the camera, and that can be frustrating, especially in tight areas like a deep pelvis. Um, and when, it's, when you're driving the camera yourself, it's much easier. The rigid, long instruments are also difficult to work with in tight spaces and for sewing and tying. Um, it's hard to retract in the bony pelvis, uh, like uh, Faf was just describing to you. And if it, most of us would agree that after a difficult, obese male LAR, um, you're feeling pretty beaten up at the end of the day, and it's quite not ergonomic. Um, and for these reasons, the conversion rates are still, I think, um, pretty high. And for those reasons as well, uh, even up till now in the U.S., uh, up to 50% of colorectal surgery is still done open. And you can see um, that this is old data, but you can see that in non-high volume centers, laparoscopy was still slow to kind of pick up even when laparoscopy was really popularized and well adopted. So because of all these difficulties with laparoscopy, um, robotics came about to help deal with some of these technical difficulties and make life easier for surgeons a technically better job and I think better for the patient. 
And Intuitive introduced the DaVinci um, to the market in 2001 after it was FDA approved in 2000, with the first robotic colectomy being uh, reported in 2002. And this came with several technical advantages over laparoscopy with the three dimensional view, it's much nicer, uh, the tremor elimination, the stable surgeon controlled camera, improved ergonomics and comfort. As you saw, ambidextrous capability, you can use your left, you can use your right, wristed instruments. And with those technical advantages, it's easier to suture and tie in tight spaces. Uh, you get more precision and dissection, like Fat was telling you, was showing you. You can see the nerves, you can dissect really nicely. Um, with these wristed instruments and the, sp and the sp staplers that come with the robot, it's really much easier and better to staple uh, in difficult areas. And for all of these, re these reasons, you get reduction in conversion rates. And Fahab showed you some of this data, but laparoscopy has been slow to really pick up in, in terms of adoption compared to robotics. And this data is really more pronounced uh, more lately. So I'm going to again share another video. Sorry, bear with me. So Fahad presented uh, all the stuff on TME and showed some uh, wonderful videos. I'm just going to show you some of the benefits of actually having um, the new platform, the XI, over the um, SI and some of the things that you can do. So with the With the XI, you have a longer camera, 8 millimeter camera, 8 millimeter ports. Uh, you can port hop, uh, you can get um, lower in the pelvis with your camera, and, uh, and it's easier to work in a more than one uh, quadrant, which is, I think is really important in rectal cancer, uh, to be able to uh, start with a splenic flexure, free it up, and with the same docking, uh, do, the, do the TME. Um, you also have the benefit of using Firefly to demonstrate perfusion, um, which you'll see in a second. It's more important to do it for your colonic conduit as opposed to this part of the uh, distal rectum um, before you staple. Uh, but you'll also see how much easier it is to put the stapler in. This is an easier patient uh, than previously shown, a female um, with a wider pelvis and a thinner one. And you can see how easy it is to kind of uh, move around there. And I want to show you, sorry, again, a separate video which shows how for the same patient, uh, this is typically how I'll start with any, um, with any rectal resection. I usually start with the IMV, um, so you can do one docking with the XI. You can start with the IMV and medial to lateral approach. Here you can see we're push, uh, holding up the IMV. You have three instruments, so one is holding up the mesentery. Uh, your assistant can help, and you can work with two instruments. Bring the camera in and out um, easily. You're controlling it. It doesn't get dirty. It doesn't move. Uh, you can use this wonderful vessel sealer extend, which is really nice to even dissect with, not to mention to seal vessels. So once we've divided the IMV, you're developing your medial to lateral plane. Um, you can't really feel, so you have to be careful with the tension and use precise sharp dissection to identify your planes. Here you see uh, we find the pancreas, um, the tail and body of the pancreas, and medial to lateral you can easily kind of get through into the lesser sac, which you'll see in a second. And ultimately, uh, you can free up the flexure uh, almost completely from um, a medial to lateral approach, which I, I find much easier, and this is what I usually start the case with. Um, you can use the scissors, you can use a vessel sealer, whichever you like, you can use both. Um, but here you can see how we're kind of releasing the tail of the pancreas completely there. And then what we do is we place a piece of gauze over the pancreas, come around the lateral side, and it's just peanuts after that. It's much easier to release the flexure like this. And then with the same docking here, you can see we find the gauze and the spelling flexure is uh, released already. And from there, you can move down to the uh, take the IMA and start your TME dissection. All with the XI, you can do that um, with with one docking. Much easier, much less frustrating. Reduces operative time and uh, solves a lot of the issues that we have in a lot of the old studies with uh, robotic uh, rectal cancer. Um, Falk went over really nicely all the data. The only thing I just want to re-emphasize is the robot helps a lot. 
in the challenging cases. So if you look at the roll our data, most important take home messages I think is it reduces conversion to open compared to laparoscopy with the hard cases, the ma males, the obese, and the ones who were intended to have a restorative procedure. So in order to be good at the challenging cases, I think you have to do the easy cases first. So again, sorry, another video, I have to pop over. Um, so moving on to colectomy, I just wanna show you a video of a colectomy. This is a obese male with a, um, with a splenic flexure cancer, we're doing a left colectomy uh, robotically. So, uh, so after uh, kind of doing the entire dissection, we're dividing the colon on both ends uh, after do using Firefly confirming perfusion. Uh, here we're doing the intracorporeal anastomosis. Marcos showed a really nice video uh, also, um, but we put stay sutures here to line up the uh, colon together. And uh, and then we plan to do a side-to-side -side isoperistaltic stapled uh, intracorporeal anastomosis. Here you can see uh, we're doing the colotomies on both ends. The third arm is holding up the stay suture, easy exposure, much easier to do than laparoscopic, I think, in my hands at least. Uh, you do your stapled anastomosis, and then what we do is, uh, like Marcus was alluding to, there's this critical portion here of the collot common colotomy that you have to pay attention to. So we place a stay suture there as well. And, and then with that stay suture, we kind of fish mouth open uh, the, uh, anastom the colotomy so that we close it and we ensure that we get that critical point in the uh, colotomy. We hand sew this with a V-lock um, in two layers. Uh, this patient did wonderfully post-op day two. He was gone and went straight to work. Uh, we pulled the specimen out of a, a fantasy uh, extraction site, just like Marcus was alluding to. And uh, I think that reduces hernia rates as well. Uh, we do this similarly for right colectomies. And I think it's particularly important uh, for obese patients because those patients, when you do an extracorporeal anastomosis, laparoscopic, you're gonna need a big incision. Uh, so I think this really shows you the benefit um, with more precision, easier ability to do an intracorporeal anastomosis robotically than laparoscopically. I think in mo most surgeons' hands, you can use a firefly, confirm perfusion, whether or not that helps, um, we'll see with the, some of the newer data, um, but I think it definitely doesn't hurt. Um, the lower incision her incisional hernia rate is significant uh, when you pull the specimen out of a transverse or, or fantasial incision as opposed to a periumbilical midline with a laparoscopic extracorporeal. And I think what it is is probably that you create less tension on the mesentery when you pull up the colon for a, uh, for a extracorporeal. Um, I think when you leave it inside the abdomen, uh, tension-free, your bowels probably recover quicker. So what's the data on colectomy? Um, so there was one randomized trial only done for right colectomy, lap compar compared to robot, and that was by a single surgeon in Korea, and it showed no difference in complications, pathologic outcomes, uh, conversions, length of stay. The robot cost more and with a longer OR time. Single surgeon a while back, though, a while back. Um, and then there's at least five meta-analyses uh, with thousands of patients comparing robot to lap. And in general, that data shows longer OR times of the robot with quicker return of bowel function probably a lower conversion rate and otherwise comparable clinical outcomes. The problem with all this data is that a lot of it's old, with older uh, systems and with a mix of intra and extracorporeal anastomoses, which is the main problem with all this data. And so if we try to tease out whether it's the robot that's helping or the laparoscope that's, uh, or the uh, over -lap laparoscopy, or whether it's the intracorporeal versus extracorporeal anastomosis, I'm gonna show you several studies. The first one is uh, a study looking at robotic intracorporeal versus robotic extracorporeal anastomosis. And that shows a quicker return of bowel function with those who underwent intracorporeals. And then when you take another study that compares similarly laparoscopic ICA to laparoscopic ECA, you again have quick, quicker return of bowel function with the ICA group. When you look at another study that compares specifically robotic ICA with laparoscopic ICA, 
uh, earlier first flatus was noted with the robotic group with similar length of stay. So I think what this data tells you uh, preliminarily is what really helps is uh, the ability to do an intracorporeal anastomosis. And, and not as much the robot, but what the robot gives you is the ability to do that intracorporeal anastomosis more frequently in more surgeons' hand. I think hands. I think it's more generalizable. I think more surgeons will do an intracorporeal more comfortably than they would laparoscopically, and they're more likely to do it that way. Um, so I think that's the benefit of robotics in colectomies. In in addition, the incisional rate, rate is significantly lower because you're able to do an uh, intracorporeal and then pull the specimen out of a fan and steel or a transverse uh, incision. So moving on to uh, to ventral rectopexy, uh, again, I'm going to share a video real quick. So this is actually a female this time to help you see better. Uh, of a, a lady with rectal prolapse and uh, we're doing a ventral rectopexy here with the XI as well. So we suspend the uterus and uh, we have three instruments and an assist. Uh, we're doing the lateral dissection here. You can see a lot of the benefits of the robot here. Uh, we move on. Uh, it's all, all these videos are sped up just for the sake of time. Here you can see the anterior dissection much easier than the other case. Uh, we're getting into the uh, rectovaginal septum and going all the way down. You can see the real nice precise uh, dissection with the robot. And we can go all the way down to the distal rectum upper, upper anal canal with this uh, with this technique. The exposure is great. Your camera is not moving. Uh, you're you're coming in and out. You're not dirtying your camera. Um, it's much less frustrating and actually more fun. And I think with these surgeries specifically, you do a much much better job. This is biologic mesh which we typically use. You can see how much easier it is to get those distal most uh, sutures. Uh, down in the rectum, do them well, and tie them well. Um, I think really this is one of the one of the surgeries that I do that I really appreciate the robot uh, much more than laparoscopy. <clears throat> you can see the third instruments up there retracting. Your assistant can help bring in and out the sutures, take the sutures out, sometimes cut suction any smoke if you're doing a dissection. So you can see we sewed it way down almost at the perineal body. And here we're sewing the mesh down to the um, to the sacrum. I'll move on. So um, looking at the data uh, for um, for ventral rectopexies comparing robotic and lap, there's only one randomized trial, and that's a really small one comparing 16 and 14 patients in Finland, which showed no difference, but really small numbers. Uh, there was a systematic review recently that uh, had about 260 patients comparing robotic and laparoscopic ventral rectopexy, which showed no conversion, no difference in conversion, morbidity, or recurrence rates. The operative time of the robot was longer, but the length of stay was shorter with the uh, with the robotic group. Uh, there are miscellaneous applications. I won't go through all, but I think transanal excision is wonderful with the robot, much easier than TEM and TAMIS. Um, single port surgery is being revolutionized, I think, with the robotic platforms. Doing rectorectal tumors and cysts with the robot, I think, is is wonderful. We've been able to do cysts that uh, were large enough to require both an abdominal and perineal approach in uh, in old times, but now with the robot, you can go way down even beyond the cyst or the tumor into the ischorectal space and pull it out from the abdomen without even having the morbidity of a perineal incision. I think it's really a wonderful approach for things like that. Just going briefly over cost effectiveness data, um, because many people, um, have issues with the cost associated with robotic surgery. When you talk about cost, it's important, I think, to consider three things. The fixed cost, which is uh, buying the robot initially, the service and maintenance, and the non-disposables. There's the non-fixed costs, the disposables, basically. And then there's the downstream costs, uh, things that uh, kind of can benefit or detriment, cause detriment to cost indirectly, like conversions, length of stay, effect on uh, complications, recurrences, and hernias. And uh, this is 
a really good study decision analysis model done by the University of Minnesota. Most previous studies have shown that uh, robotic colorectal surgery increases uh, the cost of an episode of care by about one to two thousand um, dollars. And there's a lot of things that go into cost. And this study aimed to look at quality of life effect, um, all the three different types of uh, costs that we discussed early in the earlier slide and compared open laparoscopic and robotic approaches in both colectomy and proctectomy. And it's a busy slide, but that's basically all the things that they took into consideration, which is a lot. And if you look at the colectomy data, um, it basically shows that open is significantly more expensive than both laparoscopic and robotic with worse quality of life. Nothing unexpected. When they looked at laparoscopic versus robotic for colectomy, it was about $1,300 more expensive to do it robotically with similar quality of life. But then they played with the numbers to make suggestions on how robotic colectomy would be more, more cost effective. And what they found was that the disposables per case should come down by $1,300 or the OR time should come down to below 172 minutes, which I think is easily doable. And or, or the hernia rate should come down to less than 5%. And I think that's also easily doable. The same data from for proctectomies published uh, uh, separately. Uh, and it shows that, again, un not unexpectedly, open surgery has less quality of life than both laparoscopic and robotic, with, um, and it was more expensive. When comparing robotic to laparoscopic specifically, robotic was more expensive by about $900 per episode of care and with the same quality of life. And then when they did those similar calculations to make robotic proctectomy more cost effective, uh, quality of life should be better than laparoscopic for more than six months after surgery. The cost of the disposable instruments should come down by more than $900. OR time should be below 280 minutes, which is something doable, I think, with the learning curve, with the XI platform, and with time. Uh, length of stay should be reduced by 0.2 days, which I think is something easily done. And quicker return of work from a societal standpoint by two days, which is something doable, I think. These are some criticisms um, so, uh, people have about robotic surgery. The one big one from a technical standpoint is that there's no tactile sensation or haptic feedback that you have with laparoscopy and robotic surgery. And I think the 3D camera and all the instrumentation helps make up for that. What I found is using visual cues to kind of uh, determine your tension and your tissue planes uh, makes you a better surgeon. You do your surgery more precisely with sharp dissection as opposed to the kind of the pulling and tugging and um, that you do with laparoscopy. And I've become a more kind of a better laparoscopic and open surgeon after doing robotic surgery. So it's part of the learning curve. I think you get used to it and you become a better surgeon. The other big criticism is that you can't work in more than one quadrant, and that's important in colon, uh, in a colon surgery. Um, and that, I think, has been resolved with the XI, much easier to do. There's a, the uh, paired trump fed with the uh, integrated table motion that helps with exposure and repositioning patients in different quadrant surgery. Cost, I think, is continues to be an issue and needs to get better. And I think what, how we can help is we can standardize our processes as individuals and institutions. Um, and I think with more competition in the market, things will get better. Uh, operative time is always an issue early in the learning curve, and I think uh, what helps with with reducing that is standardized teams in the OR, standardized processes, and I think early in your learning curve, having the right help and setting small goals with time limits when you start surgery to reduce that time. So in conclusion, I'll leave you with kind of one quick video again. Um, these are to show you some of the intangible uh, benefits of robotic surgery. Some of it's data driven. Some of it is just personal experience um, with some intangible uh, technical aspects like uh, the, like what you see here. So this is a lady with um, upper rectal cancer. We did a tumor specific TME and a hysterectomy and she had an air leak after her anastomosis was done. Not something we love to see, but you can see how nicely you can move around the camera for exposure. You see where the leak is. You have uh, instruments helping you. You find it, and you can see how easy it is to fix this 
almost as good as open, if not better, in terms of visualization and the ability to suture. And we were able to fix this decently. This is something I think would be a struggle uh, with most laparoscopically. Again, doable, but not as well, I think, in most hands. So this is something more generalizable for most surgeons, I think. So we put another suture here. And then what we do is another air leak. If I can move this forward, I can't. Sorry. But you see how much easier it is to suture and tie in these tight places. And we do another air leak and it works out. So not something you'll find in data, but something you kind of tend to uh, find with your personal experience with, um, with using the robot for these intangibles. So I think in conclusion, uh, robotics and colorectal surgery um, helps reduce conversion rates in challenging rectal cancer cases. Um, it's more comfortable, more ergonomic. The risk of instrumentation uh, helps you do intracorporeal anastomoses and suturing. The surgeon controlled camera is really helpful and helps improve efficiency. It may improve outcomes in colectomy and probably will in the future. Uh, I think cost effectiveness is going to be an issue for now, but uh, we can work on that. Teaching specifically, I think, is a real benefit in robotic surgery. We, the robotic platform has really wonderful simulators. So by the time you're ready to touch your first human, you're really good technically at uh, um, kind of all the technical part of using the, the, the robot. Um, also, you have the dual, the dual console, which helps you teach your residents, your fellows, your partners, even um, in a safer way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shafi. That was the first uh, time you saw the XI in the picture. Yeah, oh yeah, this was our gift. Um, yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you all for lovely presentations. <clears throat> I actually I don't have so much questions from the audience. Uh, I will start by telling you the, the, the great uh, closure video you had. That convinced me totally that I should do robotics. No, seriously. Um, I mean, you don't have to convince me, but do you do any any laparoscopic rectal cancers or, or ventral rectal axis nowadays when you have the robot? Never. If I have the choice, never. And most of the times I do, thankfully. And I think this is what it's all about. I think it's the uh, the access to the robot. Uh, I see. Then you have some centers that have very, very skilled laparoscopic surgeons that doesn't need the robot. But the majority of the new surgeons, the young surgeons, especially with with uh, few cases, I think they will benefit more with robotic surgery. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, you know, I think what, what the important thing, sorry, the important thing about robotics is these difficult things to do laparoscopically, yes, you have wonderful laparoscopists out there, um, and I'm sure in this group, but you want something generalizable technically to the general community of surgeons, whereby they can do some of these things minimally invasively as opposed to having to convert to, to do some of this stuff. I totally agree. Uh, I Actually, I love that you showed um, your interest in intra, uh, respectively, extracorporeal anastomosis. Before I go into that, I just have a question for you. This happy penguin in your mesh, what is that all about? The happy this penguin, you, the, the happy face, the penguin. Oh, yeah, yeah. so, oh, so you know, when we put... <laughs> I knew you'd comment on that. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the mesh we use, we cut into shape. And so it's a, it's not symmetric. It's not a rectangle. We hockey stick it at the end. So you have to kind of mark it. The, the orientation, you can either put Northwest, Southeast, or you can draw a smiley face. on there. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we're we're over time now, but I will still take ten minutes for questions because I think it's really necessary to hear all the speakers what they have to say. Uh, again, uh, regarding intracorporeal, extracorporeal anastomosis, and all the studies that you showed, great, but. That leads me over actually to Marcus. Can you please, Marcus, tell us what's going with the America study and when will we see all the data? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Roger. I think that the, the well, uh, this is, I think, a very interesting topic too. I think tracoprenastomosis has been uh, evaluated and assessed uh, in different studies. Probably there's no big uh, perspective, multicentric study uh, assessing uh, the potential benefits of, of this technique. This is why, as you are aware of, we uh, well uh, created this, this uh, protocol and are running uh, the uh, minimal invasive um, uh, well, uh, right colectomy and anastomosis study. Uh, it's a, a huge multicentric uh, study in Europe. Uh, it has now like around 56, I think, centers and uh, more than 900 patients enrolled. Hopefully, uh, we will have the 1,200 patients enrolled by the end of this year. And uh, the aim is to compare both intracorporeal and extracorporeal anastomosis and also lab versus robotic surgery. I hopefully I think by by early next year we will have data to uh, well report and to publish. Uh, I, I can tell that we are already observing differences. Of of course I cannot disclose the the outcomes, but the the well it looks like we are going to find something with this with this study. Uh, we will see. I think it's still a little bit early uh, to to well uh, have a strong idea, but we are looking into, of course, post-operative outcomes, uh, quality of life, uh, even uh, the the oncologic outcomes, which would be or will be reported in in a couple of years. So hopefully, early next year we'll have the perioperative outcome uh, with the thirty day. Uh, post-operative outcome uh, results published, and in two years, uh, the oncological outcomes. As we are also looking into the different degrees of lymphadenectomy and different, let's say, uh, qualities of, of, of procedures. Thank you, Marcus. Another question for you. Uh, in your in your uh, presentation, you said that uh, you. Uh, start to do 3D reconstruction on every patient, and then now you stop. Why have you stopped? Is it because you're more confident in the dissection? Is it economy? Uh, why don't you do 3D reconstruction on every patient? I think it's a matter of, of uh, time of the radiologist and also a matter of, of uh, how comfortable you are yourself looking into the, the CD scan images. So. Uh, I think that after, uh, well, taking a look to, to uh, tens of, of uh, CT scans, trying to read the vascular anatomy, you become a little bit more experienced. And I think you're able to understand the vascular anatomy by uh, spending some time in reviewing high quality uh, CT scans, which usually are done with one millimeter slides. Uh, as I just, I, I think the the, I mean that that's the main reason. Uh, the if if I would have a, a cheap tool uh, which wouldn't take time of our radiologist and wouldn't make any any kind of of effort for us to do it, probably we would still do it. But most of the tools that are available uh, are not cheap and and require extra effort. We use them in the beginning. I think it makes sense in the beginning. We stopped doing it, uh, well, a couple of years ago because of those reasons. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, one last question for you. I know the audience want to hear this. Do you uh, bowel prep your patients when they are undergo CME? No, no, no. He undergoes CME you know, when they undergo an uh, intracorporeal anastomosis. So we only bowel prep our colorectal anastomosis. Uh, the 
uh, enterocolic or colocolic uh, anastomoses are not are not bubble prep. So only only colorectal anastomoses with uh, in which a uh, uh, colorectal uh, circular stapler uh, anastomosis is, is planned. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, are you there? Thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Um, I am so happy that you talked about the large syndrome in your presentation. My question for you here is actually how low should we go with our um, with our anastomosis? I've seen a lot of patients or patients with very low colloidal anastomosis that actually suffers more, I think, with, with their anastomosis than having a permanent stoma. So what is your preference here? When would you give the patient a permanent stoma? So it's, I think it's a very important point and uh, it requires a very clear and thorough discussion with the patient, which unfortunately many of my, many surgeons don't really engage in. Uh, they're more worried about the technical aspects of the operation, curing the cancer, avoiding a leak. So I think many do not really spend the time necessary to talk to the patients about their functional outcome and what their life is going to look like with that cost, with that really low direct perineal anastomosis. So patients who have um, who have received preoperative therapy, who are going to have a very low anastomosis. I think are going to have a probably up to 80% risk of developing LARS. And that's something that I spend a lot of time discussing with the patients. Um, I think robotic approaches may help. I try to avoid transanal surgery because there's a lot of data on that. Once you do any Tati ME or transanal approach, that rectal function is going to be much worse and their continence is going to be much worse. And the last thing that I would consider is the placement of or the creation of a pouch. So for patients that are like this, who really want to, to take a chance on avoiding a permanent stoma, I would discuss the possibility of a creation of a colonic J pouch uh, to try to help with their function. I agree. Thank you. Uh, the other interesting thing and um, something coming, uh, especially in Europe, is watch your weight. Uh, if you have a patient that is a total responder uh, with a mid or low rectal cancer, uh, total response MRI uh, with MRI endoscopy, what would you do? I think this is a very important discussion as well. Here's what we know, I think, about watch and wait today. 75% uh, roughly of the patients are going to do very, very well if you choose not to operate on them. 25% of those patients, unfortunately, are going to recur. Um, and therefore, it's very important to follow them very, very closely in the first two years with a very clear regimen, including MRI endoscopy and biopsy. Now, the data on what happens when they recur is a little bit blurred. Historical data would suggest that that you can salvage them. However, Memorial Sloan Kettering just published a series in the last year that looking at their experience with watch and words and salvage and the survival of the patients that recurred and were salvaged was not as good. And so there was a survival disadvantage to patients who developed a local recurrence in the watch and wait modality. So that's something that I would clearly discuss with the patient. I would quote a 75% chance of them sparing the rectum but I would also quote them a 25% chance of local recurrence. And if that local recurrence, there is a hint that that could be associated with a worse survival. And then you make the patient uh, participate in the decision. Definitely, because it's not an easy decision. Good. Um, I thought I would get a lot of questions from the audience. Obviously, I have the questions myself. Uh, I think just one last question before we end up here, if the participants doesn't write me any new question. Um, and it's to Shafiq. 
Safi? I'm here. Are you still with us? I am. Um, tell me, where do you think we are when it comes to laparoscopic versus robotic surgery 10 years from now for colorectal cancer and colorectal surgery at all? Uh, I think, you know, I think um, a lot of the data that we have, you know, everybody wants to see the data um, before they make a decision on changing their practice patterns or or institute or buying a robot in a hospital or, uh, you know, if insurance companies are going to cover it or whatnot. So everybody wants to see the data. And unfortunately, some of the old data doesn't really apply now. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that looks at cost has to do with long operative time. Long operative time might be because those surgeons, back when the studies were done, were early in their learning curve with the robotics, but were proficient in their learning curve with laparoscopy. And so that might have kind of uh, affected the data. I think, you know, with the newer platform, XI, uh, operative time is much, much less. Uh, so, um, so it's probably cheaper, uh, and you're using up less OR time. So, not to not to mention the conversion rate. So, I think in ten years, when there's also more competition in the market, I think robotic surgery is going to be the, be the way to go. Not that laparoscopy is going to go away, but I think um, I think some of the criticisms of robotic surgery and why some people are late or not adopting it, um, we'll start to adopt it when when it seems more reasonable to them. Um, I have a question for you, um, uh, Hi. Uh, Pre-op T3A and N1, seven to eight centimeters from the anal verge. New advent radio radiotherapy, radio chemotherapy, I hope. Uh, so this is the... the yeah, this is the exact gray zone today. We don't have a lot of data on it. In my personal opinion, and again, this is personal, I think any N1 disease indicates a relatively aggressive biology, and therefore those patients should be given neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. Now, what you choose, you know, is, is a subject for discussion, but if I am going to give the patient neoadjuvant therapy, I will give them the best neoadjuvant therapy. So. For patients like this, they would be for a total neoadjuvant therapy approach. So either short course followed by systemic chemo or the PRODIGE trial, which is systemic chemo, then chemo rats, then surgery. So N1 disease, in my opinion, even though the radial margin is okay and we can remove it safely and the local recurrence rate is small, I would prefer to give them their chemo and their chemo radiation before surgery because N1 disease indicates high biology. T3 and zero, T2 and zero, in my opinion, are better suited for upfront surgery, avoiding the side effects of radiotherapy and the low anterior resection syndrome and the complications that come with it. But again, this is, again, if you look at the NCCN guidelines, this is not in the NCCN guidelines yet. It is, however, in the ASTRO guidelines. So the ASTRO, the American Society of Radiation Oncology is a little bit ahead. And I think it's gonna be an issue of debate in the coming years. Thank you, Frank. Um, Guys, thank you so much for uh, your efforts and the nice presentations. I would like to hand over to Sarah now for the final statement. Please, Sarah. Thank you, Roger, for being the moderator for our first webinar. Seems that we reached the end. I would like to thank our speakers for their great talks. A special thanks to Na Nari team and especially Mr. Ennis for their great work in conducting the webinar. For the membership and further information, please visit our social media account as seen in the slide. Hoping to see you in the upcoming scientific activities. Please don't forget to choose uh, to use the link in the chat box to, con uh, to uh, obtain your CME hours. Have a great night. Thank you all. <laughs>